So after a long period of trying to avoid zombie-related why you wouldn't survive scenarios, the undead, er, I mean sorry, infected, have come dragging me back to discuss another scenario of a widespread infection that literally decimates a large percentage of the world's population in a short time. We have been discussing opposing living organisms like mutants, mole people, ancient alien dusty boys, and the spawn of hell, but nothing quite sends dread into your soul more than an invisible threat like a highly infectious virus or bacteria. Left 4 Dead deals with the green flu infecting a large population through an airborne virus while also transmitting it through bites, scratches, and bodily fluids. Dead Rising spreading it through wasps and bites. The T-Virus of Resident Evil invading your body through polluted drinking water, blood transfusion, and bites. So I figured let's do a zombie infected game that takes the genre and gives it a whole new means of transmission and also develops a whole new source from which no one expected the virus to be created from. I'm looking at you, Toad, you sneaky bastard. This week we're taking a look at a shroom leads to your doom, a spore leads to some gore that'll leave you on the floor not begging for more, baby Zoe needs middle-aged Bill, feeling a bit bitey that leads to the kill. My Brutas, that would kill you quicker. Daredevil would be an OP clicker. Big Fungus only on PS4. And Uncharted 3, Undead Nightmare game itself. This week, we're saying why you wouldn't survive The Last of Us Zombie Apocalypse. As I said with any zombie-related apocalypse, there must be some kind of disease or virus that suddenly runs rampant and turns a bunch of innocent humans from the healthy party to the I'll eat your face off and rip you apart party. The answer for The Last of Us comes from a fun guy. No, not you. Go back under Princess Peach's blouse. A fungi or fungus that includes microorganisms like mold, yeast, and of course mushrooms. It was the cordyceps brain infection that stemmed from a certain fungi that abruptly wiped out 60% of the human population within just a few months. But how the hell does a bunch of fungi end up sending the humans of The Last of Us into an apocalypse? Most would assume fungi are just a different form of plant. However, that is far from the truth. Plants rely on photosynthesis and carbon dioxide to get nutrients from the sun and air while fungi do not need any direct sunlight at all. Fungi also lack roots and instead have a similar looking hyphae. But most importantly, fungi reproduce themselves via spores, not seeds or pollen, releasing them into the air when fully grown or matured. Some people would say that fungi are closer related to animals in that they have a higher place on the food chain since plants are usually the bottom bitch of that food pyramid. They gain this higher spot mostly due to the fact that they acquire sustenance by dissolving molecules with digestive enzymes secreted externally. That's enough on the Bill Nye Inc acquisition of the fungi, so you may ask, how does a fungus end up vitiating a large portion of mankind? Well, it does take some inspiration from the real world, after all. The Ophiocordyceps unilateralis is an entomopathogenic fungus, a funny word that basically says that this fungi is a veritable parasite that feeds on living organisms, only insects and arachnids in our current world, and uses them to reproduce and flourish. What do I mean by uses them? By basically disorienting and causing horrible displeasure in a host until eventually their brain functions and motor skills are hijacked. As is the case for a bullet ant in South America recorded by Planet Earth featured on BBC, the fungus directs the ant to go upwards to a high place but is immediately displaced by healthy ants who basically quarantine him by throwing him to the jungle floor. This poor insect eventually dies due to the fungus shutting down all major organs and using the body to reproduce and grow as fungi tend to like dining on stationary, dead, decaying organisms. Once the fungus has had enough of the dead body and has grown exponentially, it will proceed to release spores that will invade the bodies of any other nearby bullet ants and ravage their population. During this BBC special of Planet Earth, Richard Attenborough describes, Since parasites like these stop any one group of animal getting the upper hand, the more numerous a species becomes, the more likely it will be attacked by its nemesis, a cordyceps fungus. Damn, nature! You scary! If that statement doesn't scare the shit out of you, I don't know what will. The cordyceps will intentionally go after a species that is plentiful in number. Considering insects, and more specifically ants, are the most populating animal group on the planet, it's no wonder this parasitic fungus preys on them so virulently. However, what if the fungus found its way past the kingdom of insects and decided to hunt into the mammal kingdom? Humans outclass other mammals in the world by a large margin considering we are the apex predators of the planet. Reaching above 7 billion homo sapiens, it would not be a surprise if the fungus decided to latch into much larger and more intelligent prey. Agricultural crops being grown in South America had unknowingly been infected by this fungi after it had possibly instructed a host bullet ant to invade local crops, most likely due to a virus mutating it to act more viciously and to a degree more tactically. Going undetected through food inspections and FDA approval, markets, grocers, restaurants, and food vendors had all been selling food with a very noticeable side effect. The fungus had begun developing 
dumping molds on the foods shortly after hundreds of thousands of people had already consumed it and were hospitalized for potential food poisoning. This almost instantaneously spurred numerous massive recalls of any associated foods farmed from South America, Mexico, and Central America. This was much like the swine flu scare back in 2009, but much more realer than what caused immediate public health concerns after it lied dormant in host in Veracruz, Mexico for months. With the Food and Drug Administration being superseded by the Center for Disease Control, both organizations panicked to stop a potential plague. Their primary concerns were a health crisis, but simple food poisoning would be the least of their concerns. Hospitals were swelling as more patients flooded in, but with the first few days, patients were becoming erratic, violent, temperamental, and chaotic. Echoing the outbreaks of universes like Left 4 Dead and 28 Days Later on their initial outbreak, however, instead of having an unknown origin or rage-infected monkeys, it's reasonable to see how this infection gained a vice grip on the Western civilizations as a whole. The Last of Us saw the initial outbreak of people being infected through food consumption. But what crops and natural resources come from South America? Well, with the tropical humid environments of the area, foods such as cashews, pineapples, papayas, and even avocados are grown and distributed from there. However, these are small fry of consumable exports coming from South America. And no, I'm not about to say cocaine. No, I'm talking about something more addictive, and that's coffee and cacao. Brazil leads the global exportation of coffee and is in the top for cacao, the most crucial ingredient for chocolate. CHOCOLATE! Interestingly enough, back in 2000, a fungus spread into a large portion of South American cacao plantations, hence why chocolate prices went up that year. Yep, that is right. If you enjoy eating and drinking chocolate and coffee, you are probably screwed. Goodbye, a majority of modern civilization. With the general population consuming these highly produced exports, it's a reasonable excuse to see how a large populace got infected so quickly instead of relying solely on other people biting, scratching, vomiting, or having sexual contact with each other. Although the infected of The Last of Us tend to do just two of these four. I'm not seeing them vomiting on others or bumping uglies with other people. While truly deadly in its beginning stages, the viral fun guy puts the host through four different stages of what would be called the cordyceps brain infection, infecting the brain of people that consume the fun guy where the cordyceps reproduced at an exuberant rate, growing a mycelium, the fungal equivalent of a plant's roots, in the victim's brain tissue while also killing brain cells, destroying high cognitive functions, and sending the victim into a violent tirade without really any critical thinking or reasoning. This first stage of the infection transforms the person into a runner, which is wildly reminiscent of the infected in 28 Days Later, and to a degree, left for dead, as the person gains rabies-like symptoms and attacks all non-infected personnel near it. Their teeth will corrode and become jagged as their eyes degrade and glow orange, showing distinct facial patterns and somewhat, but not very successfully, trying to hold back their violent attacks as they sometimes refrain from attacking non-infected people nearby. Not in all cases, mind you. Which this may be a case to prove that the host is just a temporary, fading passenger within their own body. They aren't any different in other humans when it comes to survival. Being stabbed in the heart or jugular will dispatch them. Strangling them and cutting off their oxygen will kill them. Basically anything that doesn't involve starving them or dehydrating them. If these hosts are able to survive long enough between a week to a month after initial infection, the cordyceps will take hold more and more and mutate the person further, entering the second stage known as the stalkers. They will begin to show growth on their cranium and parts of their face, partially blinding them, forcing the creature to slowly rely more and more on a watered-down version of echolocation, a method used by organisms who are either blind or live in perpetual darkness, using the reflection of sound waves to spot prey. They have become more feral, but even more so, more tactical on hunting. Still having some vision, once they eyeball something they want to hunt, they can actually hide behind cover and sneak towards their prey, showing hunting instincts at full effect. However, since their window of infection is usually between a week to a month, they aren't typically seen often far into an apocalyptic future scenario, so they'll most likely be prominent within the first year during the initial outbreak, as those who survive from the beginning will infect others, and so on and so forth. Until eventually, those that have been a stalker long enough will change again after their freshman year. The most iconic for the franchise franchise and infamous for the protagonist and antagonist alike, the third stage of life for the Cordyceps host is the clicker. And no, I'm not talking about you. Go away. The person's face has completely been taken over by the growing fungus, destroying its sight, making the creature completely rely on echolocation just to move around and hunt. This is where they get their name as they are constantly clicking to just do this echolocation and figure out what's in front of them and what can be eaten near them. The fungus has hardened around its face and hardened to the point that it can take one to two shots from low caliber bullets and their muscular strength has also been magnified enough to overpower regular survivors. Once grabbing prey, they won't hesitate to sink their jagged 
jagged teeth in, as the cordyceps' main prerogative is to spread the infection. Once they are completely aware of a survivor's location, they will berserk towards them, hardly flinching from any gunfire unless you're shooting a shotgun or high caliber round at it. Being in close proximity may mean certain death, but at a far distance, they can be confused as their means of echolocation can only work so well unless in a vastly quiet and closed space. If you end up surviving for the long run, you will most likely be running into these variants at a higher and higher rate. If a cordyceps infected is somehow allowed to live for 10 to 15 years, their last known form of transformation becomes the bloater, completely enveloped in the fungus that had previously only shrouded its head and minuscule amounts of the body. Considering the head fungus acted as a protective plating, it's only natural to assume that they are able to withstand excruciating amounts of damage since the plating covers most of their body. This also means their strength is magnified even further, allowing the hulking abomination to rip and tear anyone it finds, and if you're young and frail enough, able to rupture your insides with one punch and kill you. That's right, we have a one-punch man zombie. The load of biomass on its body has slowed it down immensely, and its use of echolocation has actually become hindered as its form of hearing has also been reduced due to the plating. So one could assume that gaining a safe distance from this beast would be the appropriate action to take. However, it can also hurl naturally producing balls of mycotoxins at survivors in order to stun, hinder their breathing, causing them to cough, and potentially poison them. These are what the cordyceps can do to a living specimen, but they can work double time once that specimen has died and decayed. Much like the flood from Halo, it will decompose the body and use its biomass to spread and cling to a nearby surface, making just this disgusting heap of bodies and just gross shit. Barely much of the body will be left. However, the fungus will begin producing large amounts of infectious spores into the air that will infect unknowing survivors when inhaled. Any areas that have large amounts of these dead infected will be swarmed with these clouds of spores so it will become common practice for anyone that has survived long enough to carry a gas mask just so they can venture through these dangerous territories. Cordyceps had adapted to allow their host to survive harsh cold weather and physical damage, but due to their fungal-covered nature, are very flammable. But not needing food or water, living primarily through as fungus, slowly using the body for sustenance to survive, the fungi itself is always in immediate danger, even if its host is alive or dead. That will most likely not go away unless the bodies, towns, structures, and even air it is inhabiting is completely cleansed with fire. You're gonna need an ass load of fire just to get rid of these guys. So this has been a different take on my videos, where it's mostly the lore and more about the scientific aspects on the spread of the fungus, the stages of the infection, and what danger each stage presents. But what exactly mandates that this means you would survive? Like I said earlier, it all starts covertly within our own food and water supply. We as a society don't really question the foods we consume that we purchase from stores and restaurants. We fully trust government agencies like the FDA and the USDA and all legal vendors that they are under to safely check the quality of our foods. But sometimes things slip through the cracks and outbreaks of food poisoning related issues occur in the general public. If most of our crops of cacao, coffee, pineapples, and avocados were contaminated with this fungus unknowingly, it may have been too late for a majority of us, considering how much chocolate and especially coffee people eat and drink. Most adults rely on coffee to get their day started and continue to drink it throughout the day to stay awake during the workday. Taking this into consideration, if you are a chocolate, pineapple, avocado, or coffee fiend, you will have a high probability of being one of the first infected that are rushed into the hospital. If you weren't one of those unlucky people to eat your way into dying, the chaos of the outbreak in the first two days would probably lead to your demise. Simply getting bitten, scratched deeply, or something similar of that nature will spell doom for you. The runners will overwhelm most forces with their sheer numbers, and considering they had the rate of infection to kill off 60% of the human race in just a few months is horrifying in of itself. That boils down to how safely fortified you are during the first few days and who you run into as well. The military was immediately acknowledging that anyone potentially infected is just a walking biohazard, so they will shoot on sight if they suspect you of being bitten or succumbing to the virus. You're going to have to look nice and healthy while approaching the military or government personnel or else your brain matter will be splattered everywhere. Not being intelligent though, the runners will most likely just dogpile against structures not 
knowing how to open doors, you're basically just fighting the 28 days later zombies or infected because they're rabbit, violent, and highly infectious if they get a hold of you. And minus those guys, you're gonna have to rely on either your established survival skills or you're gonna have to learn very quick how to get food, water, guns, and meds, how to shoot, how to combat fist to fist using supplies of any nature to your advantage. You're gonna have to learn pretty quick. But unlike 28 days later, the zombies infected of the universe get worse and more deadly with time instead of dying out to malnourishment. Becoming more resistant to ammunition could exhaust your supplies fast if they come by the hordes, which is a persistent issue in The Last of Us. You're constantly having to find new supplies. You'll also basically be living the scenario of the quiet place, refraining from making as much noise as possible to not attract the attention of clickers and bloaters. Surviving more and more will pit you against people with ill intentions once society has crumbled, who are going to be wanting to kill you for supplies, even just down to your shoes. If you're also lacking a gas mask, just breathing in the wrong area will get you infected. The universe of The Last of Us creates a mutatious mushroom-headed horde that wants nothing more than to rip you apart and create more and more by hijacking your body in order to dethrone our species as the dominant race. The militaries of this world did fight back by bombing and setting ablaze to highly populated areas, but it didn't seem to have much of an effect. It will take the immoral bombardment of high explosives in major cities and many rural areas at the onset of the infection just to stop this fungi from raining over the globe or else, once it spreads enough, it's game over, man! It's game over! Even killing the infected without burning them will make things worse for the immediate area. Spores in the air? Your body will care. Of course, if you're a rare specimen of a human that is immune to the effects of the cordyceps brain infection, you're going to be in the clear if you're getting attacked, but you could still be ripped apart. But the odds of you being immune are extremely slim, like you're hitting the lottery slim. And if humans are brought down in population size enough, then this cordyceps infection may move on to other mammals, just like they moved on from the bullet ants to other insects, and they may take over the next dominant mammal race. The cows. Imagine it. The cordyceps cow infection. <coughs> That about shrooms up this look into The Last of Us. Did I miss out on any details about these shroomish boys? How screwed would Super Mario's Mushroom Kingdom be? Is this a more deadly outbreak than Left 4 Dead or Resident Evil? Let me know in the comments. I decided to not discuss much about the fireflies. If 10 million fireflies and focus less on the lore and more on the biology and its effects of the cordyceps fungus. So if you have any feedback you need to share, let me know in the comments. This was a video that wasn't actually a poll result in a long time, but people have been asking for a while, and I'm holding off on the polls for a bit while I formulate newer, fresher videos with special guests planned. If you like this video, comment, sub, ring the bell, and feel free to donate to my Patreon or check out one of my official shirts on Teespring. Any monetary donations would very much be appreciated as I shout you out. Thanks to Lovable Tester, Mario, Nato6141, Nurkardoy, Ascension, Song of the Void, Irene, Twilight Duck, Castlev, Daniel Tapia, Exploding Burritos Experience, Shill Arby Turtle Lord, DJ Cheatham, Kimberly, Summer Denny, Stubbs the Zomb, Super Amazing Hot Dog Batman, Taylor07, Synatics, The Silver Jedi, Ninja Kirby 935, The Lonely MV14, Taylor07, Snow, Adrian Velasco, Christian Reese, Ghost Host, Mindless Cheeseburger, Gage Drenzy, Synatics, Jake's YouTube channel, Thomas Bailey, Cold Wolf, Tea Kettle, Biscuits, and Sloth at Goth. Thank you for your generous donations to Wow Such Gaming. That's all, folks. Until the next survival video, I'm Zach S, aka Wow Such Gaming. Don't forget to always stay wow. Well.